Bye. Let's go to John in New York. Hello, John, and thank you for calling. Good evening, everybody. Good um, evening. I, I'm fairly certain nobody wants to see people suffering, and everybody would love to see everybody get the health care they need. But the bottom line is, as we have it now, there is absolutely no way that everybody is going to get quality, affordable coverage and will still be able to have innovative health care when pre-existing conditions is taken off the table for any insurance system. It's kind of like if you have a car that's already on fire and you call up GEICO and demand that they cover it. it, it you know, I would love to see everybody be able to get health care, but we would need massive tax increases across the board for everybody to see that happen. And my, my problem is Obama tried to get this uh, government payer health care system through. The blue dogs turn on them, and then it passes in reconciliation. Trump tries to repeal Obamacare. The Republicans turn on them, and they put together their own thing and get that passed. All we've seen is our taxes go up each and every time, and neither one of these bills has actually improved health care. And you think, you think that with all of the advances in the technology, the x-ray machines, CAT scans, MRIs, you think with the advances in drugs, you think with the more availability of drugs, you think health care costs would go down, but they're not going down. They only keep going up. And right. the amazing thing about it is this, there's only like 322 million Americans tops. Right. The biggest problem that we have is the fact that our jobs have left the country and the jobs that are remaining are being taken over by robots. And until they point. address that... Yeah. Universal or government paid for health care will be inevitable because the vast majority of people, they're, thought, they're talking about 30 million people who are uninsured. But the simple fact is you've got an entire generation, this Generation Z that's coming up right now, and they're not going to be able to get jobs. Yeah, and they're so poorly educated. And they're that's so, another they're, conversation. Well, that's a whole other That's thing. a tech conversation that we need to have. That's that's that that's not a healthcare conversation. That's another well, conversation. Well, John, and John, thank you. Thank you so and John, much. John, thank you for let me let me raise this. You know, he mentioned some things, you I know. I got that, a lot to say, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> of course, of course, of course. We we have time to say it. You know, it's interesting. I don't think any of us would ever buy a car or an airplane or a home before signing on the dotted line unless we knew exactly what the costs were. So how important was it? Should they have waited on the Congressional Budget Office score? Does it matter? And how would that impact this process going forward, Capri? Um, a couple things. I mean, I think that it's always more responsible to wait for the CBO scoring. Um, but I, I think in this context, that there are two, there's two calculus at play. One. The bill that passed today was, was, was amended, it was an amended version of the one that came out in March that, that came, that fell short. So there was a CBO scoring on that. Um, and so I think that, you know, proponents of the bill and those that are defending, you know, the absence of a CBO scoring would say, well, we already have, you know, a baseline for the CBO score because this is just amended. Now, you know, there's all kinds of speculation that this would actually go even further in, um, increasing the numbers of those that would lose coverage. Um, it's always better to have more information, but I think that um, ultimately they made the calculus that if you go home for recess, people are going to change their mind, and they wanted to get this done while they had a bird in the hand. Um, and again, I agree with everyone. I could not agree more that we should not be making these kind of decisions, not only in haste, but based solely on the political capital expended right. or earned. Uh, these are human beings, and no one is paying attention to that. Um, and, and I get the, the business, you know, side of this as well. Um, and I, what, uh, the last caller, I believe John said about, you know, you wouldn't, uh, you know, call somebody and have them insure a car that's already on fire, but the, so much goes into what, how these individuals have a pre-existing condition or not. As I said earlier, it may be hereditary. You may not be able to do anything about it. Um, and, and so 
you know, but the insurance companies are ultimately the big winners here because they're the ones that it's not a good business proposition for them to cover individuals with pre-existing conditions because it is too expensive. We are too focused, frankly, on the coverage issue because that's just the structure of our insurance market and, and, and how people access health care in the United States, and that's fine. But we need to focus more on cost transparency of yes. actual medical services. We need to focus on pay for performance so we align uh, health care delivery with the, uh, you know, with the appropriate level of care for the individual seeking it. Um, all of these things over time will help improve health outcomes, and not just from a health standpoint, but looking at some of the, uh, as a social worker say, person and environment issues, food deserts and the like. So I mean, there are all kinds of, of, of factors that go into this, and if, unless we address the underlying cause of why these people are expensive and why the system of actually accessing the care, the actual purchasing of it, is continues to go up, the insurance issue is just a means to an end. And you um, mentioned something. You mentioned something that I wanted to point out in terms of food deserts. Not all people who have pre-existing conditions are, you know, diabetic, you know, have heart disease. But those that do, those that we can actually control, perhaps we need to um, think about innovation and, and personal responsibility programs where we are putting together community gardens to offset some of that. Because they're not taking into account people with pre-existing conditions, but what about us? What about the responsibility that lies with us? As human beings. And there are some good stuff, but I will say that, that this is where, you know, when I first came into office, I was very skeptical of the managed care, um, you know, managed care insurance. I was like, oh, they're just trying to deny claims and whatever. Mm -hmm. I've, I've grown to really respect what managed, what managed care organizations do because when done well, and we have a lot of the Medicaid managed care, um, you know, United and, and Aetna and a number of, of carriers in Ohio that um, provide coverage for the Medicaid population, and they do just that. They build it and they get a capitated rate that says, okay, you know, per per member per month, you you know, the rate is 250 bucks or whatever um, for the insurance. So they got to try to get you know maximize that dollar, and they work very closely. They have they have um, case managers that go to people's homes with iPads. Um, they work to help you know try to provide incentives. You know, you get. Uh, uh, gift cards for the grocery store. They'll provide you with things, and 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 so it's it's an issue of also cost of of um, cost saving and sharing those those savings together between the provider and the payer, and and providing those incentives across the board. That is where you're going to find the value. Will this uh, new bill affect hold that? that? Hold that. We got to take a break. Uh, we got to take a break. Uh, call us. We see Capri and Lindsay. We're coming back, and we come straight to the call us. I'm Armstrong Williams. This is The Right Side.